right now, um, I just want to bring it in. Let's bring our attention to our speaker this evening, who really is actually one of the gems in our division of geriatrics, an incredible clinician researcher, Dr. Alex Smith. He is um, board certified in palliative medicine, and he's a really accomplished researcher at the forefront of geriatrics and palliative care, particularly for vulnerable elders and those with um, disability at the end of life. Uh, he did medical school here in the joint program UCSF in Berkeley, and then went to Boston to the Harvard programs for residency at Brigham and, Brigham and Women's Hospital and fellowship at the Dana-Farber Institute, Cancer Institute in palliative care, and a general medicine fellowship at, in Boston, so very well trained. Also got an MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health while he was there, and then thankfully came back to start on faculty with us in 2008. And again, he's really well known for his research in disability and prognosis, and one of his tremendous contributions with some of his colleagues and other folks at the Division of Geriatrics is a website, geripal.org, which is mostly geared towards health providers, but has a lot of interesting articles and blog posts about prognosis and just actually general things affecting geriatrics and palliative care. There's also a link there, um, and you can find another website that he has contributed to bringing to fruition the e-prognosis website, and that a lot of health providers use to help estimate prognosis. How topical this evening. So he's going to take us through how to think through prognosis and using information on prognosis and life expectancy in our own lives in healthcare. So thank you so much. Please welcome Dr. Smith. And if you can, if you have a burning question or, again, a burning news item, please bring it up. But otherwise, please leave your questions to the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, for that very kind and thoughtful introduction. And thank you all for showing up on a night like tonight when there is something else going on. I want to start by just talking a bit, little bit about uh, these other things that Anna mentioned here. This is my blog, Jerry Pal. I started this with Eric Wadera in 2009. And this is a lot of fun. We created this as a forum for, of interaction between the geriatrics and palliative care communities because we felt like there was a lot to be gained by having both of those communities work together, whereas there had actually been some friction between the communities um, uh, in the, around that time period. We have a lot of fun with this blog. We make videos. I'll show you a little bit of one here. This is a taste test of uh, medications that we use to help people who are constipated. This happens a lot in geriatrics and palliative care, particularly when we're giving people opioid medications. So, Eric Wadera from UCSF. Alex Smith from UCSF. Ken Kavinsky from UCSF. So uh, I actually know which of these agents are which, uh, um, but both Alex and Ken uh, don't know which medication they're actually going to be tasting today. To start off with, we have this beautiful clear liquid, um, and uh, we'll be pouring it for each one of us. This is a commonly given medication throughout the hospital and nursing homes. Um, the full capsule is the usual dose given to uh, patients. So, uh, cheers. Sweet. Has a little bit of a bite out of an aftertaste, but uh, <laughs> not terrible. <laughs> that is sweet. Um, not bad, actually. I have more. Very sweet, but not bad. So we tried a few different liquid bowel medications here. I'm going to jump to one of the others. Uh, there actually is a teaching point in here. Whoa, there's that face. Uh, that's the green one. Um, uh, that uh, oftentimes when people have, are constipated, um, they may be confused, we call that delirious, where they may have dementia and not understand what's going on, not be able to remember. And in those cases, sometimes they'll be given medication called colase uh, mixed in applesauce. And 
uh, you'll see what colase tastes like. The idea here is that we're going to try our own medicine. What are we actually giving to patients like this? I'm right? getting from our director over there. Um, same thing in capsule. The only way I've talked Ken to actually come in here is uh, that he is going. we're going to mix one of these into this applesauce container. He can try it, but both me and Alex are going to be trying this uh, beautiful, oh, much more flowy than the other ones. So uh, this is the last of our taste test, and again, let me get this one ready for Ken. So what we're going to do, a very common thing in a hospital, if somebody's unable to actually uh, swallow this pill, as you can see, it's a pretty big pill. It's got a hard capsule, too. Let's see if I can actually burst the capsule. We can edit this out, too. <laughs> We're, we're low tech, we didn't edit it out. <laughs> oh, there we go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix this beautiful coloration, kind of stings on the skin, uh, into the applesauce, just like any nurse would do, especially when somebody can no longer swallow, and we'll give some of that to Ken. So, um, Alex, you have yours? Yeah. So the third of the taste test for liquid bowel preparation. Take one, hopefully the very last take too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that reminds me of bad cold medicine as a child. No, but it burns on the way down. It does burn. Oh! <laughs> you know, first tastes like applesauce, and then it's just, oh, it keeps burning. <laughs> so what we have... Ooh, is that uh, let me try it with the applesauce. What we had here was, the very first one, the clear one, was uh, sorbitol. Oh! The second one... <laughs> <It's> disgusting! <laughs> ...was lactulose, and the very last one was a uh, colase liquid solution um, and a colase pill that was crushed and mixed with applesauce. <laughs> oh, that's awful. <laughs> there you go. All right, so that's a lot of fun. Um, I also wanted to show you my Twitter account. So I'm on Twitter at AlexSmithMD. Anybody here on Twitter? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Well... You can do fun things on Twitter, too. And actually, other social media. So I'm on this other social media platform. I'm a big user of social media. You're getting the idea. Um, called Strava, which tracks your athletic endeavors. And so today, I went on a bike ride, and I posted it to Twitter. And here is my bike ride. <laughs> That's the Richmond. OK. And then uh, e-prognosis, we're going to talk about. And I may flip back to that over the course of this talk. So the focus of today's talk is prognosis. OK, so what is prognosis? Prognosis is a forecast, right? It's like the weather, right? It's a prediction about a future event, right? And when we talk about prognosis in medicine, we're usually talking about prognosis for mortality, though we know that older adults care about prognosis for other things, like how long until they are no longer independent or have to rely on other people to help balance their checkbook or have uh, mobility impairment. The majority of my talk today is going to be about prognosis for mortality or life expectancy because that's where the majority of the research has been done today. I want to start with three stories. This is my dad, my dad, Blake Wales Hindi Smith. He was a a uh, researcher at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan, a PhD researcher. He was at a, he was in his mid-50s and at an academic meeting when he experienced a seizure and slid under the table. He was taken to the hospital and a scan of his head revealed that he had a large brain tumor. He underwent biopsy subsequently and it revealed that this was a glioblastoma multiforme, which is an invariably fatal form of cancer. So m the next step is to have surgery um, to remove the bulk of the tumor. So I 
was in medical school at the time at UCSF. And I flew back to be with my dad after he had that operation because I wanted to be with him as he met the neurosurgeon in his post-operative visit. And I remember that neurosurgeon coming into the room and saying to my dad, I got it all, Blake. I got it all. And I was furious, right? Because I knew that that surgeon could reduce the number of cells dramatically from like 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 9th. Reduce the number of cells dramatically. But there is no way that he could have gotten all of that tumor, right, with the surgery alone. And my dad, you know, he worked at a medical school. He's a researcher, taught at a medical school. He looked up the information too. He knew what his prognosis was, and yet that neurosurgeon's statement played into every hope against hope that my dad had at the time. So I channeled that anger, tried to channel that anger as a force for good, and learn more about prognosis and how to communicate with people about prognosis. That brings me to the sort of next stage in my career. As a resident in Boston, I was in a small primary care program, and I remember reading an article by Louise Walter, who's the chief of the Division of Geriatrics here at UCSF. And her article described an individualized approach to cancer screening in the elderly. The idea is that cancer screening is designed to detect slow-growing cancers. Slow-growing cancers. It's not designed to detect cancers that are going to hurt you, cause symptoms, lead to death in the short term. It detects slow-growing cancers. And so it only makes sense to screen people for cancer if they have a long life expectancy and will live long enough to benefit from detecting slow-growing cancers. And that life expectancy should be individualized to the patient in front of you, and that some patients who are elderly beyond the normal guidelines for stopping cancer screening may be very healthy, may be running the dipsy on Mount Tam. And other patients who are younger and who guidelines say should universally be screened, well, it doesn't make as much sense for them because they have multiple chronic conditions, because they have multiple disabilities, dementia. Their risk for dying is much greater and they're unlikely to benefit from cancer screening. So I took that information. I thought, OK, this is great. I'm going to use this, and I'm going to go talk to my patient. So I went and I talked to a patient. This wasn't the same patient, but this is a patient like that patient. And I said, congratulations. We can stop screening for breast cancer. And I felt the temperature in the room drop a little. And then she said, well, why, doctor? I've been getting mammography my whole life. And I said, well, you're not likely to live long enough to benefit. <laughs> and then I could feel the temperature in the room drop further. <laughs> and I realized, you know what? Uh, there's an art, not just to estimating prognosis, but to talking to people about it. And there's a communication skill there to be learned. So that's one of the reasons I went on to obtain training in palliative medicine, where there's a tremendous emphasis on patient-physician communication around difficult topics, such as life expectancy. So then I came back to UCSF, and around that time, there was a statement made on social media that completely changed the landscape of healthcare in this country. And that statement was made by Sarah Palin, and it was about death panels. And if you remember around that time, 2008, 2009, there's tremendous excitement because they were crafting the legislation that would change health care and the way we pay for health care for the uninsured in this country. And there were several provisions in there about palliative care. And when Sarah Palin made that statement about death panels on Facebook, social media, by the way, all legislation related to palliative care was stripped from the Affordable Care Act, right? Sensible provisions that would have allowed doctors to talk with their patients 
about things like life expectancy, making plans for future care, and doctors would have been reimbursed for this, stripped from the Affordable Care Act. You know, I, there were proposals to pay for education for palliative care trainees, stripped from the Affordable Care Act. The word on the street in DC was that palliative care was toxic. It was toxic to talk about palliative care. And so this sort of made us think, you know what? We actually think that there aren't death panels, but that in fact knowing how long someone has to live is critically important information in medicine. And so we bent about building our case for the importance of prognosis in medical care. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, all of the work that I've conducted in this area has been funded by these funding agencies, including the National Institutes of Health, the Hartford Foundation, the Greenwall Bioethics Foundation, the Hellman Foundation, and the Bechtel Foundation. So the learning objectives for today's talk are to describe the reasons prognostication is essential, to present methods of estimating prognosis, and to discuss if prognostic information should be made public. Let's start with the first one. So what is prognosis or prognostication? So there are two parts to prognostication. There's the forecasting, which is estimating the probability of an individual developing a particular outcome over a specific period of time. That's the prognosis. That's the forecast, like the weather forecast. And then there's the foretelling, which is communicating the prognosis with the patient and their family. And I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about the forecasting and the science and the research that goes into estimating the probability of developing outcomes and, um, and how we communicate and how we um, present that information uh, to physicians and perhaps to the public. Uh, but I will tell you that I also am funded to do research in communication of prognosis and how do we communicate prognosis to older adults who are living with serious illness or disability. I'd like to start here with a case. This is Miss A. She's an 89-year-old nursing home patient with congestive heart failure, end-stage kidney disease, <coughs> cognitive decline, and dependence on others for all activities of daily living. Those are things like dressing, bathing, um, getting from a bed to a chair. Should Miss A discuss the possibility of hospice with her surrogate decision maker? Yes or no? All right, show of hands. How many, everybody has to vote, and you can only vote once, <laughs> but everybody has to vote, it's election day. So how many say she should discuss the possibility of hospice with her surrogate decision maker, raise your hands? Oh, how many say no? All right, few no's, mostly yeses. So we'll talk about that case as we go through. So when people hear about prognosis in medicine, one of the first things they always think about is hospice. And that's because hospice requires, hospice Medicare, the hospice Medicare benefit requires that two physicians certify that the patient has a prognosis of less than six months left to live if the, disease, if the disease runs its usual course, okay? That is hospice eligibility requirement where prognosis is baked in to the regulations. What people often don't think about are all of the other incredibly important uses of prognosis in care of older adults. And I would argue that prognosis is a key ingredient in virtually every decision we make in older adults. And that ranges from decisions for patients with very short life expectancies. So for example, for patients who have less than four to six weeks left to live and who, have a who are depressed, there are medications called SSRIs that you've probably heard of, like Prozac. Um, those medications take weeks to months to act. And those patients don't have weeks to months. So there is another medicine that we start in patients with short life expectancies called methylphenidate or Ritalin, which you've probably heard used for ADHD. 
and that acts over the course of a few days. This is very useful for patients who are nearing the end of life. There are also differences in surgical decision making in terms of what kind of approach you would take to somebody who has a cancer in their spine that's impairing the spinal cord, causing nerve dysfunction, whether you would treat that with surgery or whether you would treat that with radiation. You know, a lot of people are on statin medications these days, right? So many people on statin medications these days. But at some point, does it make sense to peel back those statin medications? Are you really going to prevent a heart attack when somebody has less than six months left to live? But where is that zone where you start thinking about pe peeling back that medication? A huge part of that hinges on prognosis because that buildup of cholesterol you're trying to prevent, that happens over time. And when time is short, it doesn't make sense to continue those medications. Um, so things like you can have an aneurysm here, right? People who have less than one to two years left to live, it doesn't make sense to operate on that giant swelling of the aorta that is likely to rupture if you leave it alone over time, right? Choice of heart valves can matter too. If somebody has a blown heart valve, is it better to put in a mechanical heart valve or a bioprosthetic heart valve, which comes from animal tissue? Um, and then things like diabetes. Diabetes, very common disease, right? We treat diabetes with insulin in order to keep the blood sugar low. We do that to prevent what we call microvascular complications of diabetes. Those are things like retinopathy, having trouble seeing, and nephropathy, problems with the kidneys. But it takes about eight to 10 years to develop those problems. And then you think of the trade-offs of treating someone intensively with insulin management, all those finger sticks every day. It seems like a little thing but it adds up over the course of years if somebody need, doesn't need to have that happen. And sometimes you give somebody too much insulin and then their blood sugar drops too low and then they fall over and then they might break their hip. And that's terrible because you're not, if they have less time to live, then you're doing that without a good reason, right? And then we're gonna talk about cancer screening. So a lot of these things are preventative treatments, right? These are patient, so prevented, uh, so prevention, uh, let's see. Uh, so the, inter the, the key point here is the intervention should be targeted to patients whose life expectancy is longer than the time to benefit, right? That's sort of the equation we're looking at. A lot of these preventative treatments we're talking about here have upfront harms, right? You think about finger sticks, the low blood sugar, those are harms that people experience up front. Cancer screening, how many of you had a cancer screening of one type or the other, right? So cancer screening, there are all sorts of potential harms. If you've had a colonoscopy, right, you may have heard them say that there's a one in 10,000 risk of rupturing the colon, right? It's kind of rare, but that's a horrific sort of harm, right, that you have taking the risk for up front. But those benefits, they accrue over time. So the life expectancy needs to be longer than that lag time to benefit um, in order to benefit from the, the, uh, the preventive intervention. So let's talk, here's some of that data on colon cancer screening. This is from Say Lee, who's in our division. And what he's found is that it takes about 10 years for people to benefit from cancer screening because those colon cancer uh, screening is designed to detect slow-growing cancers, right? And that compared to people who are screened, those who aren't screened, they do just about the same for the first 10 years, right? You don't really see that mortality benefit until about 10 years. Now, I did some research out in the community, and I asked 65 older adults in English and Spanish and Cantonese and these are older adults who were disabled in some way, so they needed the assistance of somebody else to carry out their daily activities. And I asked them, if your doctor thought you had less than five years left to live, would you want them to talk to you about it? And a majority of them said yes. <coughs> and they said, you know, I want to hear about not just life expectancy, but these other things, like how long until, like what kind of life am I going to have, right? because I care as much about quality of life as I do about quantity of life. 
And so we thought, okay, these are some of the things that came out of those interviews. Uh, in terms of the life, you know, when we talk to, to people who are living uh, with disability out in the community, they're not thinking about like all these medical decisions we were making, right? And, like methylphenidate versus SSRI or even cancer screening. They're thinking about the life choices they need to make, right? These are social choices often. Like, should I, like how, how to prepare myself spiritually, religiously to get right with God, to prepare my family, um, whether I need to consider moving in with my children, moving nearer to the grandkids, if there's anything I can do about this, like, can I exercise more, change the way I eat? Um, do I need to start arranging for uh, a durable power of attorney for finances so that somebody else also has control over the bank accounts and the checkbook? Do I need to prepare my home for a time when I might not, not be as mobile? So prognosis is important for medical decisions and also for the life choices that people need, need to make. Um, so now I'm going to move on to talk about methods of presenting, methods of estimating prognosis. Okay, who's this? Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr, yes. <laughs> Niels Bohr. And why is he famous, Niels Bohr? Atomic theory. Atomic theory and um, was one of the, uh, the big thinkers behind quantum physics. And somebody asked him, <laughs> right? Um, what, do you, what impact do you think um, uh, quantum physics is going to have uh, 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 on, the, on the field? And he said it is exceedingly difficult to make predictions, particularly about the future. And that was funny because one of the things that he contributed to is something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where you could know something about a particle's location or its trajectory and speed, but you couldn't know, but just by measuring it, you would alter the trajectory and you couldn't know both with much accuracy or something like that. I don't know. Um, so what's the best way to estimate prognosis for our 89-year-old uh, resident, Miss A, of the nursing home, and whether she should have that discussion about hospice? So here are three different ways to prognosticate. So option one is clinical judgment, all right? This is probably what most physicians do in this country is they just sort of, you know, um, I know the patient in front of me, I've seen a lot of patients, I kind of think they might have about this long left to live, right? So what do we know about the accuracy of clinical judgment? Um, this is, there have been several studies and they put them together in a summary of studies called a systematic review. And what they found is that physicians tend to overestimate patient survival by a factor of between three and five. <coughs> they overestimate by a factor of three and five. They tend to be much more accurate for short-term prognosis than long-term prognosis. And this is one of the things I find most interesting. Physicians are highly influenced by relationships. We love our patients and we get to attach to them over time. The longer a patient, a, a physician has known a patient, the more likely they are to be erroneous in their prognostic estimate and the more likely they are to be optimistic. So we buy into that optimism, that hope that it might be longer than it is. So what's the takeaway from this information? I don't think clinical judgment is very good. <laughs> and unfortunately, the, you know, I normally think, you know, who's the best person to judge? It's your primary care physician, the one who's known you the longest. That may not be the case because they may be subject to these biases that they may, may be unconscious, right? But working against their ability to accurately prognosticate. All right. So here's a different way to prognosticate. You can look at population averages. So you could look at life expectancy for men or for women. This is life expectancy for women in this figure. Uh, and this is just taken from um, like life tables that are developed from the census, actually, right? 
So if you look at people in, the, in, this, in this case, the, the life expectancy has been stratified into three groups. The top 25th percentile, 25th percentile of life expectancy, those who live longest. The lowest 25th percentile in red, those who live the shortest. And the median sort of 50th percentile, right? Those who have the average life expectancy. And it's interesting, you can see that for someone who is 80, who is at average life expectancy in the blue, they have a life expectancy of almost 10 years. They're likely to live till they're about 90. A lot of people don't understand this, and a lot of trainees don't understand this. They say, wait, they live to be 80. Average life expectancy is somewhere in the mid-70s, so they must not have long to live. They probably have a life expectancy of two years. But no, that's not the way it works. If you've made it to be 80, you're likely to live another 10 years, right? Because you've survived that far. Um, and yet, those who are in the worst, uh, the lowest 25th percentile have a life expectancy of five years. And those in the best have a life expectancy of between 10 and 15 years, somewhere around 13 years, let's say. So this is pretty neat, right? This is pretty neat. And this is helpful information for looking at averages, right? Big groups. And it helps us sort of, you, it's even sorted a little bit into these three different groups. But it's kind of hard to tell if the patient in front of you is in that middle group, that top group, or that bottom group, right? And then you're getting back to clinical judgment. So that worries me a little bit. I think it's a vast improvement over clinical judgment alone. So then there are these things called prognostic indices. OK, so what is a prognostic index? So a prognostic index is a clinical tool that quantifies the contributions that various components of the history, the physical exam, and the laboratory findings make towards a diagnosis, prognosis, or likely response to treatment. OK, so what does all this mean in plain language? So doctors know that if somebody has heart failure, they're at greater risk for dying. They know that if somebody is 90, they're at greater risk for dying than somebody who's at 80. And they know that somebody who is so disabled because of their chronic lung disease that they can't walk a block is at greater risk for dying than somebody who just has uh, mild lung disease and needs to use an inhaler every once in a while. But the challenge is, how do you put together all those little pieces of risk from the heart failure, from the age, from the disability, and then use that information to estimate life expectancy? That's what a prognostic index does. It takes all of those pieces of risk and allows you to sum them up in an equation to estimate life expectancy for an older adult. Oh, for anybody, but we focus because I'm in geriatrics and you're at this talk on older adults. So, uh, so prognostic. So physician. So Nicholas Christakis is a, a, a f famous physician researcher in this country. He was at Harvard. Now he's at Yale, and he's really interest. He was really interested for a period in time in this is issue of prognosis, and. Because his PhD is in the social sciences, he decided to look back at the history of prognosis in medical textbooks and medical training. And he went back to one of the founding fathers of medicine, and William Osler, and looked at his textbook. And he found that at that time, textbooks were pretty evenly divided between three different things. Diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis. And what he found is that over time, as he went through textbooks, the same edition of those or textbook over time, edition, 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 the amount contributed, the amount of the textbook devoted to prognosis became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the amount devoted to diagnosis and treatment as our technology and our medical science improved and our ability to diagnose and treat became much bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, a long time ago, 150 years, one of the main things that doctors had to offer was prognosis. How long do you have, doc? You know, what does this mean? Um, but that has become an increasingly small proportion of textbooks. And I think that is um, to the detriment of a lot of medicine in some ways. 
Um, uh, and physicians are inadequately trained in prognostication. In a national survey of 697 physicians, 57% felt inadequately trained in prognostication. Uh, other studies have shown that combining clinical estimates with prognostic indices results in more accurate predictions than either alone. And that makes sense, right? Because there are flaws, as we've seen, in the clinical judgments, but there also can be limitations to these prognostic indices. The prognostic index may not capture something that the physician knows about that patient, right? They have Parkinson's disease, and that's not mentioned in this prognostic index. It might be captured to some extent in how disabled they are, but there might be something else going on the physician knows about that's not in the index. Um, so we talked about this. So, okay, so this brings me to this systematic review and the story of Lindsay Yorman. So Lindsay Yorman is the first author in this paper. I was the senior author. So who is Lindsay? So Lindsay was a medical student at UCSF, and in 2009, 2010, 2011, somewhere, I think it was 2010, 2011, she decided to take a year off and do research with me. So I knew she was interested in prognosis, so I gave her that book by Nicholas Christakis, Death Foretold, Prophecy and Prognosis in Medical Care. This is the book that mentions, he's the, the guy who does that study of medical textbooks. And she read the book, and she was inspired. Actually, mostly she listened to podcasts of him instead of reading the book, because that's what people do these days. <laughs> but anyway, um, she was inspired. And then she said, wow, this prognosis thing is really important. Um, we just, we're, 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 what's being done about the science of prognosis these days? And it turns out that a lot of people in our division, Division of Geriatrics at UCSF, have done work in the area of prognostic estimates. Um, led by my mentor, Ken Kavinsky. He was the um, uh, gentleman who uh, had to have the coles mixed in applesauce. <laughs> that's, that's my mentor. Um, good sport. Um, so, uh, so he's one of the world and world's leading experts in developing these prognostic indices. And there are a number of them that bear his name or that he's a, an author on. So Lindsay was going around meeting with the other researchers in our division. She got really excited about all these prognostic indices. But what she realized is that they're kind of, you know, buried in the literature and nobody's actually using them. And so we decided to try and highlight them a little bit more so that people might actually use them. So we did what we call systematic review. We read through thousands of titles, right? We searched thousands of titles using these big search engines, uh, Medline, PubMed, um, Google Scholar. And we identified hundreds of prognostic indices. And then we read through the abstracts for all those articles. And we narrowed it down further. And we identified 16 validated, I'll explain what that means, non-disease specific prognostic indices for older adults. So we wanted to focus on prognostic indices that were general and could be used in any situation. Not ones that were specific for people in the intensive care unit. Not prognostic indices that were specific for people with cancer or specific for people with heart failure. These are general prognostic indices, non-disease specific. And validated means they've been validated in some way, meaning that they've been tested in a, de developed in one population and then tested in a different population. And so we identified these prognostic indices and then we evaluated their quality in terms of their accuracy and their generalizability. And let me see if I have a slide on, yeah, so we recommended use of the highest quality prognostic indices in conjunction with clinical factors not captured in the index and patient preferences, which we feel should be an important consideration when you're talking about medical decisions that rely on prognosis. So we said to Lindsay Yorman, Lindsay, congratulations, you're awesome. You have a first author publication in JAMA. You've won. Right? This is terrific as a medical student. This happens so rarely, right? 
And Lindsay was kind of one of these jaded medical students who was skeptical of the whole academic enterprise. And she said, I don't know. <laughs> Looks good for you. You're in academics. You get it on your CV. But is that actually going to change anything? <laughs> Are clinicians going to start using prognostic indices because you published this thing in JAMA? And we thought about it, and we realized Lindsay was probably right. So if you think about all the steps you need to take in order to use one of these prognostic indices, like let's say you get Miss A, who is an eight, our, our 89 year old nursing home resident, who has congestive heart failure, end stage kidney disease, cognitive decline, and dependence on others for activities of daily living. Um, how are we gonna estimate her mortality using those prognostic indices? Well, you could go to the table in our paper, and you could say, okay, these are the two prognostic indices for residents of nursing homes. And I could say, okay, which one of these had better test characteristics? Okay, um, let's see, the, 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 the ability to discriminate between those who live and those who die is slightly better in the PAROC versus the Flacker index. And then we could say, okay, well, let's see whether there were any potential sources of bias here. Okay, and then we're gonna, we're gonna decide that the PAROC index has the best accuracy and is the least biased. So I'm gonna flip back in the article to the citations so I can find that citation for the PAROC index. Okay, now I've got the citation. Now I'm gonna look up that article. So okay, here, good. I have found it in PubMed. All right, so I'm gonna click on that article to download it. And uh-oh, I'm blocked. It says you have to be a member of the Gerontological Society of America to download that article. So it's not that easy to get to the article. Fortunately, I'm at UCSF, I have a workaround. I can log in using my VPN and then access that article through the UCSF library. And oh, conveniently, this is good. At the back of the article, they actually have a table here which lists all of these risk factors. And so then you can put, assign a score to your patient depending on how old they are, uh, how they score out on these different factors. And then you can look up their risk and okay, fine, and you can get out your calculator, your pen and paste, paper, and finally you might have a prognosis, right? So we thought, okay, there's gotta be an easier way than that, right? <laughs> there has to be an easier way than that. So that's when we launched, we launched our website ePrognosis, which stands for Estimating Prognosis for Elders, the same day that we published our paper in JAMA. And it uses some simple drop-down menus to help you find the best prognostic index for the patient that you're caring for. Where is your patient? Well, this is Ms. A, she's in a nursing home. Does she have dementia? No. What time frame best fits the clinical issue? Six months or less, right? We're thinking about hospice eligibility. So then you can answer some of these questions about Ms. A. Was she admitted to the care home facility in the last three months? Has she lost weight unintentionally in the last three months? No. Does she have renal kidney failure? She does, yes. Does she have heart failure? Yes, she does. Does she have a poor appetite? No. Is she male or female? She's female, et cetera, right? Simple, Add, click on these things, right? And then we force people to guess their best guess of prognosti what the patient's prognosis is because we kind of want to see how people are doing in terms of estimating prognosis. And then we hit calculate risk. We also have down at the bottom here, we have some information about this prognostic index, like who was studied to develop this prognostic index. And the clinician can think, oh, are these patients like my patients, right? How similar is this population to my population? How similar is the population in which the index was developed? And how similar is the population in which it was validated? Right? How well does it discriminate, that's what this figure is here, between those who live and those who die? And then we give people a visual display of prognosis, okay? As illustrated by the graphic below, out of 100 nursing home residents with similar answers, 58 will die shaded and 42 will survive over the next five years. I'm actually gonna cut to e-prognosis right now and I'm gonna show you um, a, this same prognostic index. We've updated, you can see, with some fancier graphics here. Um, 
I'm just going to randomly fill out some of these responses here because I want to show you what our response page actually looks like because it's more interesting than that um, static response. And I want to get your thoughts about this. <laughs> this is my opportunity to do a little research here. Okay. Uh, all right. Actually, you don't have to fill them all out. I'm going to do this. Okay. Calculate risk. Okay. So here you can see. Out of 100 nursing home residents with similar answers, 58 will die, and those are shaded, and 42 will survive unshaded over the next half a year, six months. And so you can see that the graphic is changing every few seconds. So what, why is the graphic changing? Updating, Updating with real-time information about new statistics on how nursing home residents like this live or die? That's not it. I wish. Maybe someday. <laughs> Other ideas? Attention grabbing. It's attention grabbing, yeah. <laughs> it kind of moves, right? <laughs> but, yeah. Other ideas? Geographic location. Geographic location? It's not based on geographic location, yes? Is it weighing the risk factors in different ways against each other? It's not weighing the risk factors in different ways against each other. We need to stop doing this because nobody gets it. Time is going on as the slide is presented. So more people are dying? That would be, that's an interesting idea too. Actually, there are, each time it changes, there are always 58 people who are shaded and die and 48 who survive. The reason we had this graphic change, some people have said all sorts of things. They say, wait, this person right here, okay, they're, a lot, they're dead. They're dead, okay, and then let's see what happens. They're alive! <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> That's not the way it's intended. The idea is that it's meant to convey uncertainty. We may have an idea of a probability, right, that 58 out of 100 people will die, but for any given individual, we don't know if they will be one of the 58 who die or the 48 who survive. And that was the idea behind having it change every few, that was our clever idea, right? Sounds clever when you think of it that way. But when you just show the graphic like this, people have absolutely no idea why it keeps changing. So we're probably, that didn't work so well. Anyway, all right. Uh, um, okay, so right, so this is our updated website. So we also, so this is, you know, this has been one of the most fun things I would do, I've done, and we were just like completely blown away and humbled by the response to e-prognosis. Now, especially because clinicians now come up to me and they say, I use e-prognosis. Um, you're the e-prognosis guy? You're one of the e-prognosis guys? Um, I should say this is, I'm all one of them. There's a team of people, including Say Lee, uh, UCSF in our group, uh, Mara Schoenberg, who's at Harvard, Eric Wadera in our group here at UCSF that work on this. Um, but, you know, surgeons, there are a group of surgeons here who routine, routinely use e-prognosis on all their older adults. Why? Because they want to know, you know, is the patient likely to benefit from this surgery I'm going to do, which has a lot of upfront harms, right? We are like essentially making them dead and keeping them alive with anesthesia, and then we're cutting them <laughs> and pasting things. Um, that's a big deal. Um, are they going to live long enough to benefit from this knee replacement, this removal of prostate cancer, that kind of surgery? You know, dermatologists who say, does it really make sense to be cutting up this person's face, taking out these skin cancers? Are they going to live long enough to benefit from what's likely removal of a very, very slow-growing cancer? And, and we got approached by primary care physicians who said, you know what, e-prognosis is kind of a neat thing, but it doesn't really tell me directly what to do for the patient in front of me. And I want something that's a little more directive about the decision I'm making every day in my primary care practice. And that's screening for cancer. Should I be screening for cancer in my older adults? Can you tell me that based on prognosis? So now there's an app for that. Uh, we made the e-prognosis app. It's available. Everything we do is available for free, I should say. We make it all available for free. It's paid for with your tax dollars through NIH funding or foundation support. So it goes back to the people. It's free. Um, so this is our app for free. You know, interested in 
uh, screening for colon cancer, breast cancer, or both. And you can see neat like little touch screens so you can enter in the information about your patient, you know. And then you get a result. That's a recommendation here, right? Getting a mammogram is more likely to harm this woman than to help. Thus, getting a mammogram would generally not be recommended. And we just kind of have that fuel gauge of uh, harms greater or the benefits greater. And that hinges critically on life expectancy. And then we give them quantitative information, right, about life expectancy. Of 1,000 women like this woman who get a mammogram, 100 will experience a harm in the first year. And those harms are things like, you know, false positives, right? Psychological harm from that. Additional biopsies, right? Additional mammograms, right? Um, and they, they can even be more serious. Treatment for a breast cancer that never would have harmed them in their lifetime. Surgery, right? Chemotherapy, radiation, right? Those are serious things. So it's kind of a range of harms from the less serious to the more serious. After 10 years of 1,000 women like this woman who got a mammogram, one will avoid death from breast cancer. So it sort of puts this you know, benefit into terms that patients might be able to understand, and physicians too, for that matter. And then what's the risk of, in terms of their life expectancy and mortality? After 10 years of the 1,000 women like this woman, 900 will die whether or not they get a mammogram. So that's kind of the key pieces of information a, patient, a physician and patient need to know in order to make a decision. What are the benefits? What are the harms? And am I going to live long enough to experience the benefits? Um, this is our web-based version of that ePrognosis cancer screening app, which tells the same information, also for free. There are other prognostic indices that I should mention um, that we don't put on e-prognosis because they're disease specific. This is one that's excellent out of the University of Washington called the Seattle Heart Failure Model. There's another specific one for breast cancer that's also well known. And this is actually on the National Cancer Institute's um, website as well as cancermath.net, which I believe is a site put out by uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. So some of you might be saying, but wait a second, really? A calculator to estimate prognosis? That seems impersonal. It doesn't really know the patient. It's, it's something that captures risk for populations, not specific individuals. But on the flip side, you know, you, you could argue that calculators are unbiased. They don't suffer from those same biases we talked about that physicians might have about their patients, over-reliance on a specific test, hoping with their patient that it might be better than it actually is. There's no what I call the chagrin factor. Physicians are notoriously motivated by their last bad experience, and they use that to make decisions for their patients going forward. But the calculator doesn't care about that, right? It doesn't put too much emphasis on one test. Ah, another good quote. Difficult to see, always in motion is the future from Yoda. So now we're going to get to the more interactive portion of our talk to discuss if prognostic information should be made public. Um, I've been asked to try to hold the questions until the end. So we'll try to go through this, and then we'll hopefully engage in a lively discussion about this issue. So. I'm going to take a vote, though. Everybody has to vote. Everybody can only vote once. So should ePrognosis, our website for estimating prognosis, be accessible to the public? Raise your hand if you think it should be yes. OK, a lot of people. Raise your hand if you think it shouldn't be no. A few people argue no. Good. Good. So we have vote, votes on both sides. So you know, we, we've been thinking about this. We continue to struggle with this. You know, what are the potential harms we're thinking? And hopefully you'll come up with some others of opening this up to the public. Well, we present statistics, right? The average numeracy skills and ability to understand statistics of the lay public is poor. And so might people be misinterpreting these statistics in the statistical presentation? It's hard enough when, you know, we're 
changing the people and their living and the dying and all that, but not, you know, much less having the numbers uh, 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 that are you know, complicated statistically. Uh, on the, and then is there possible for doing harm by telling people their prognosis, how long they might have to live? Is there a possibility it might make people, you know, I talked about that study I did in 65 older adults and that the majority of them wanted their doctor to talk to them about prognosis. Well, the minority also had really good reasons for not wanting to talk about prognosis, right? It'd make me depressed. I would dwell on it. I'd think about it every day. Um, so yeah, there, there might, there may be a potential psycholo for psychological harms. On the other hand, we thought, well, maybe there's a, a role for patient activation, meaning getting people excited about talking with their doctors about prognosis. We're, the, the, the best way to have a sea change in our approach to prognosis in this country isn't to get physicians thinking about it, it's to get the people thinking about prognosis, right? And going to their doctors and saying, hey, do you have any sense of how long I might have? Is there any way that you could estimate that? And we might, we're hoping, we were hoping promote a mature, net, more mature national dialogue than what we were having at the time, which was this death panel debate, fictitious. So practical considerations in terms of making e-prognosis public. Well, all the information that we present is actually public anyway. You could go to PubMed. I'm sure you could go to your library. You could find time to get into UCSF. You could photocopy those articles, and you could figure out what the prognosis is. We're just making it a lot more accessible by compiling it all in one place using easy to, easy to use you know, drop-down menus and click buttons. Um, and then we wanted to make it easy for clinicians to access that information. Is it really possible to make it accessible to clinicians while restricting it access for the public at large? Well, we tried. We actually made our website, we had an initial window that you didn't see because we took it off that said, are you a healthcare provider? And if you clicked yes, then you could continue to eat prognosis and use this prognostic calculators. If you click no, then it said, please, these, these prognostic calculators are meant for clinical use. If you choose to proceed, please discuss this. Well, at first we said no, and then they said, this is only for clinical use and you couldn't go on. And then um, we got feedback from users saying, uh, why am I, uh, all these people you know, who aren't physicians or clinicians saying, why am I being forced to lie so that I can enter information about my family members? <laughs> so we said, okay, we won't do that anymore. So we took away the, we took away the box. Actually, we, we asked readers of the New Old Age. You heard of this? It's a blog in the New York Times run by Paula Spann. Um, we asked, you know, should this information be freely available to the public? A vast majority said it should be made freely available. Uh, Again, those are readers of the New York Times. Hard to say how representative they are of the general public. But when we opened ePrognosis to the public, we got so much attention. We had six stories in the New York Times total. We were in USA Today, this, the Daily Beast, an online publication, the AARP blog. Um, I got invited to Washington, D.C. to give a presentation in the National Academy of Sciences. In our first week, we had over half a million page views. <laughs> and in our first two months, we had nearly three quarters of a million. So a lot of it was you know, up front. And now we're over two million. And what we found is that e-prognosis is, you know, at first it was a lot of people entering their relatives, you know, mom and dad. Um, and that over time, it's changed. And now it's probably more like 85% clinicians using e-prognosis. Um, so what was the reaction of the public to e-prognosis? This was a quote, the top one is from New York Times, from a reader. This provides a useful tool to help with the dialogue and discussing various screening modalities and to give the patient an idea about life expectancy. And I love this second quote, which was one of the most critical quotes and just like nailed it, you know, <laughs> nailed the challenge. This is from Faith Fitzgerald, who was a former who's a physician here at UCSF and went on. She's now at Davis. And she was extremely well-respected, thought, very thoughtful person. 
And she said that e-prognosis represents the punctilious quantification of the amorphous. <laughs> I love that. And now we use this, we talked about this today. We said, uh oh, are we doing the punctilious quantification of the amorphous again? <laughs> Let's, hold on. And it's been an important check on us as we think about the limitations of prognosis and, 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 and the risks of, of presenting this information to clinicians and patients uh, as they're making decisions about medical care in their lives. Um, so I want to just open it up, close and open it up to questions by coming back to those three stories that we started with. And to say that, uh, you know, things have changed, thankfully, and we physicians can now be reimbursed for those important conversations that they're having with older adults about prognosis, about advanced care planning, about assigning someone to make decisions for you if you're unable to make decisions for yourself. Um, tonight's election, we'll see what happens and whether that further changes the landscape. Um, we are working on the science of communication. And I think that, you know, if I have to you know, sort of take a temperature of the field, I think the science of developing better prognostic calculators has outpaced the science of communication and how we talk to patients about prognosis. And we're trying to play some catch up in that area. And my hope is that we get somewhere because I think that I worry that there are a lot of docs out there who are still having misleading, misinformed, inaccurate, wildly inaccurate statements about prognosis uh, with older adults and with, with adults out there uh, like with my dad. And I hope that, you know, for his sake and for the sake of those other people that this changes. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Over here, what's your name? David Fisher. A uh, couple of points. First comment. Uh, there was a time, I'm old enough to remember this time, when the, both the AMA said that the practice of medicine, that you should not tell the patient what the diagnosis is and what the outcome was. <coughs> I don't know whether times were, were they right or were they wrong? I don't know. That's somebody's agenda. And this is a case history, so unfortunately. My wife was diagnosed with uh, stage four ovarian cancer. Mm. At that time, it was six months to live, was the prognosis. I mean, I said, I'm not gonna tell her that. I'm fortunately, because of the extremely good care here at UCSF and this and that, surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. She then left seven and a half years. Oh, mm -hmm. Now, if we had told her at the time mm -hmm. that because all these crunching numbers that you only have six months to live, or I actually took this seriously and said, oh, that's the way, this negative view, I, don't, I think this would have an adverse effect on her outcome. So this whole idea of playing God, which you're playing in a lot of ways, Mm. Mm -hmm. I think has uh, a, a real downside. Mm -hmm. This is terrific. So a couple comments here. First is about how um, some time ago, uh, in the not too distant past, I would say, uh, the AMA had a code of ethics where um, you didn't tell the patient their prognosis or their diagnosis. And then a compelling story about, about, um, about, uh, 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 this gentleman's wife who had a metastatic ovarian cancer and a prognosis of less than six months but lived seven and a half years. So yes, I think that we have that norms around discussion of, you know, disclosure of a terminal diagnosis and prognosis have changed over time. And uh, we've actually seen that it's been studied in the literature and they've changed over time, not just in the US, but around the world. And some of that has to do with exportation of American values around autonomy, right? Self-rule, our right to make informed decisions about our care. And, and the second point 
that you or the the story you raise about your wife is very compelling, and this is one of the checks on this whole issue of discussing prognosis, and that's I think a a major part of that story is around uncertainty, and that we have to be honest about the uncertainty around these prognostic estimates. Um, so that we're not playing God. We can't say you will live or you will die. But that the best information that we have is that you may have about this amount of time. On the other hand, it could be more like this in the best case. It could be more like that in the worst case. But that we give ranges and normalize that uncertainty. A lot of people struggle with that uncertainty because it can be terrifying. Um, but that we not avoid discussing prognosis because it's inherently uncertain, because it's probabilistic. I think it's a cop-out for physicians to throw up in their hands and say, who knows what it is? And that in my daily work as a clinician, I see patients who have a limited life expectancy make different decisions when they know that time may be short for them. When we have honest discussions about prognosis, including that uncertainty. Um, so those are some of the story, th those are some of the things that I would, um, you know, respond to some of those comments with. Uh, I will say that I've had a lot of patients, you know, I remember another, a patient whose family said, you, you know, she's in the ICU, their, their mother is in the ICU, she's on a breathing machine, she's there for like the third or fourth time in the last few months, and the ICU docs are saying she can't come off, she's going to die on this machine. And they said, wait a second, this is the third or fourth time in the last few months. She came off before. A miracle happened before. It can happen again. They told us before she wasn't going to come off. And so that we cannot be so assured in our pro about the prognosis because people continually surprise us, and we are often wrong. So when I'm prognosticating in one-on-one -on -one encounters with patients, I'll tell them, I could pick a date, but I will guarantee I'd be wrong, right? And I give them really wide ranges. And I acknowledge that no one really knows what the prognosis is. And the last piece I'll say before we get on to another question is that um, uh, I don't believe in forcing prognosis on people. That our role should be to offer prognosis to people. And that people may have very good reasons for not wanting to discuss prognosis. They may be completely unprepared. This could take away those important, right? Denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> it is an important psychological protective mechanism that is actually helpful to some people. And I would hate to pull that out from some people when it's holding them up, All right? So I think our role is to offer to discuss prognosis and explore those reasons why they're interested or not interested in discussing prognosis, and then have those discussions with people who are interested. Over here. Oh, yeah, my name's Mary Jackman. Um, I think the thing is that people in general have a really hard time with probability and understanding what probability is. And so when you talk about the general public, um, they, you, you, so when you're giving a prognosis that's based on probability, just as you showed with that graph you have up there now, yeah. for an, any individual person, it, you know, you don't know which individual is going to be affected. It's, it's all about <coughs> probability. So if, when, you, when you've got an individual patient in front of you, it's hard to just for them to know what to do with that information. So I wonder if one way you can handle that is to say, well, here's what the probability is that you will still be alive two years from now, or whatever it is. Um, but there's quite a big range around that. You know, there's a margin of error. So that sometimes people ask this long, sometimes people ask that long. To give them a sense of what the range is, um, because that is the reality. And people yeah. do vary a great deal. Absolutely. There's a Terrific point. This is about probability. I'm repeating this for the filming. Um, and that, you know, for any given individual who's not sure whether they're going to be the one of the ones who lives or one of the ones who dies. And this is another reason why it's really important to give ranges. And we give ranges, and the ranges, because there is there are all these different elements of uncertainty. There's the uncertainty in the study, 
right? Bigger study, you probably have more certainty. Smaller study, greater uncertainty. There is the uncertainty in whether this prognosis uh, applies to the patient in front of you, whether they sim are they similar to, like, to the patients in the study or not. And then there's the uncertainty about whether they'll be one of the ones who lives or one of the ones who died, because this is a study of averages and probability. So for all of those reasons, I give uh, ranges when I'm talking to patients about prognosis. You know, and for patients where it's more uncertain, I give wider ranges, particularly for conditions where there's often tremendous amount of uncertainty, conditions like dementia, for example. Yeah. Over here in the red, what's your name? Debbie. Debbie, great. Uh, is there, going back to you saying you have a certification in palliative care, because you work with that population, but other doctors that, like cardiologists or other of these specialists, would, is there a movement to try to educate those people in those areas? Because they work with people both doing better and not doing better. Yeah. Rarely do they have discussions. Right. The That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so terrific question about, uh, you know, in palliative care, we're used to having these discussions about life expectancy because most of the patients we see have short life expectancy. And the topic comes up, uh, but that people in other fields like cardiology may not be having these discussions and may not be prepared to have these discussions. And so is there movement to train more of those other providers in communication, prognostic estimation? Um, I can't speak for all the specialties out there, but I think there is a growing interest in prognosis. I think it's just we're starting to see the tide turn back a little bit um, towards including more information about prognosis in medical textbooks, in training, et cetera. And I think part of that's driven by this sort of technological imperative in our culture to do more and more, and that we're Physicians in all specialties are starting to see the unintended consequences of over-treatment, over-screening, you know, too much surgery, too much intervention, putting too many devices into people. And they're starting to say, wait a second, what are we doing here? Does this really make sense? Uh, have we pushed too far in terms of what we can do with older adults? Um, so I, I think we're starting to see some of that, but I have to say uh, it's just the leading edge. And as far as I'm aware, there, there, there is a tremendous amount of uh, communication training for cardi the average cardiologist out there. And we have a long, long way to go. Long, long way to go. Yes, in the yellow over here. What's your name? Yes, I'm Valerie. Hi, Valerie. And I, I love your website. I think it's wonderful. But there's a, there's a next step that needs to be on there, and that is how do you deal with the people around you when they get the prognosis? If you're going to share that information, um, my sister uh, was, was given a prognosis of, of maybe half a year, and everyone around her apparently knew that and caused her a lot of stress that, didn't, that shouldn't have been there. Mm. Um, she did live the six months. She also had a glioma, mm -hmm. um, but it was very hard for her yeah. because of the people around her. So if there's another page on your site that says, where are the uh, sources of um, information on how to deal with the psychological effects on, the, on your, your family and your friends, mm. how, do you, how do you go about helping them adjust? Or, mm -hmm. or just keeping that information to yourself. Mm -hmm. This is a terrific suggestion. And we, we don't have that on here. Um, and I, I, what I like about the suggestion is that we need to put these conversations in context. So to repeat the suggestion is this idea that prognostic discussions don't just happen with the patient, but that they happen in the context of a family, you know, friends, a social environment, and that there may be impacts and ripples beyond that specific patient that are um, really important to consider. Um, I'll tell you what we have done. We've developed a new section called communication to help doctors. These are sort of exemplars on how to have discussions about uh, prognosis with older adults. Um, uh, so, you know, for example, a discussion, this is Mara Schoenberg, uh, who's at Harvard discussing uh, prognosis in the context of breast cancer screening uh, with an actor. 
We didn't have a lot of money, so Hi, Dr. Schoenberg. the actors aren't Happy awesome, but record. they're pretty good. And it looks like you haven't had a colonoscopy in about 10 years. So I think we need to talk about whether or not you want to continue getting colonoscopies. You don't think I should get a colonoscopy? Well, it's not clear. I think it is important. We so I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I'm just going to point out that we are trying to help clinicians gain the skills to communicate prognosis. and. You know, and then we break down the skills into specific tasks like addressing uncertainty, making a recommendation, discussing that lag time until there's a benefit, discussing next steps, discussing trade-offs, right? Because a lot of this is about trade-offs. Um, but excellent point about the caregivers. Next point up here in the front, what's your name? Since a lot of us are really bad at understanding, oh, sorry, I'm Rich. And, Hi, Rich. Um, are really bad at statistics or really understanding what they really mean and play the lottery and things. Mm -hmm. uh, is that built into how you uh, present the prognosis to people, like giving examples that kind of really bring the statistics into uh, understandable? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, we're now developing new prognostic models. We have a big grant from the NIH to develop new prognostic models because the uh, gentleman's point is that. Um, uh, you know, all this is statistics. How are we actually going to communicate this to patients? Uh, you know, even physicians have trouble with understanding this information. What does it mean to have a 58% risk of death over the next six months? No, nobody thinks in those terms. Does that mean they're more like, it's like I guess they're slightly more likely to die? I guess they have a prognosis of less than six months, slightly. <laughs> but uh, most people think in terms of how long do I have to live? So we have this big grant to develop models that estimate average life expectancy, right? So a group of people who are similarly similar to you are likely on average to live about six years. Some will live eight years, some will live four years. On average, they live about six years, okay? And that's much more interpretable, right, than this sort of risk of death in a given time frame, 58% risk of uh, death over the next six months, right? Much less interpretable. Yeah. Over here, what's your name? Bill. Hi, Bill. Just a quick question. Uh, it's ethical, really. Uh, is there ever a situation where you can conceive of withholding information from the family, from the parent, from the patient, or whatever? Is that, or is there, are you insisting on absolute transparency? You're transparent with the patient, they're transparent with you, and so on. Hmm. Right, so the question is about, is there ever a situation where you consider withholding information from, from a patient? There are, they're rare, and they're usually in patients where there's a specific concern about their ability to cope with the information. Might it be so devastating to them that the harms are worse than the benefits, though they may be interested in the information? That, and that's extremely rare. I would probably be working with my colleagues in psychology and psychiatry for those patients. Um, but it's important, I think, to ask patients why they're interested in knowing this information. Um, and I can't say that I have ever done that myself, but I know of other physicians who have um, decided not to share that information with patients because they're so worried about the harms. Uh, in the back, yes, what's your name? My name is Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Yes. I was uh, thinking about the harm that you're saying, and I think that when the other lady in front of me saying that once we do a prognosis, especially with the menstrual patient um, in 65 and older, it's not just a disease of the patient itself, it's a disease of the whole family. So I think if we will use a prognosis, it will be a good idea that we set up a support and the grieving will start and then we'll have the support for the whole family mm -hmm. or some resources that we can provide to the family. Mm -hmm. Because it's, I used, to th I used to say before that it's reality and acceptance and I realized that it's hard to accept, so acceptance won't be accepted. So I, nowadays I say it's reality and acknowledgement. And I really love the prognosis because it will make us to prepare. I'm, with, I'm on a long-term care for about 20 years, and a lot of times when people come 
it's already making um, a chaotic planning rather than a strategic planning. Mm. So I think the prognosis, even though there's a grip that it's hard to accept and to acknowledge, I think it will make us prepare. It's just hard in our society because it's a topic that we're now starting to learn and it's hard to, but as time goes by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, there's a lot in that comment. I won't be able to repeat it all. Um, but I will note that, um, you know, one of the strands that came out of that is about this idea of um, helping family members to prepare for that prognosis, patients and family members. Um, I, I'll say that we are currently engaged in a study we, where we are presenting long-term prognosis to uh, <laughs> members of the San Francisco community. Uh, so these are older adults who have some disability, they're dependent on other people in some way. Um, and, uh, and then we, we ask them what their own, what they think their prognosis is. You know, how long do you think you have to live? And then we estimate their prognosis using e-prognosis. And then we offer to show it to them and 35 out of 36 have wanted to see it. And so we show them their prognosis and then we get their reaction. And then we ask them, you know, so we get the reaction, we record it, we transcribe it, we try to think about what does this mean. We compare their estimate of prognosis to their calculated prognosis. And then we ask some questions about, you know, how do you feel about this information? Do you feel sad, anxious? You know, are you going to start drinking? <laughs> are you going to stop drinking? Are you going to start exercising? Stop exercising? What are you, <laughs> how is this going to change? And what we're finding for the most part is that people kind of shrug. They're like, oh, okay, you know. So it says I have, you know, six years left to live, and I thought maybe I had four years left to live. That's pretty close. <laughs> you know, it's, who knows whether it's right or not. And they don't tend to be, you know, get really sad or upset about this information. I think it's, a, it's different when we're talking about long-term prognosis, which is a lot of what these discussions are about in geriatrics. In palliative care, when somebody's in the hospital and I'm seeing them and they're, they're, they're usually near the end of life, and they're, that, that, you know, they, they believe it a lot more and the, the stakes are a lot higher um, in some sense. But uh, out in the community with people who have prognosis in the order of years, I'm not sure that the harms are there as much as people are worried about. And actually, uh, there, there are some studies that suggest that, I'm talking about you know, fairly elderly folks here, they actually think they have less time to live than the prognostic estimates would suggest. And when we show the prognosis to some of these people, they say, oh no. <laughs> I don't want to live that long. <laughs> I'm already 97. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, some of these, you know, that's one of the great things about research are unexpected findings. Um, did you have a question or a comment here? What's your name? My name is Dee. Hi. Um, after being given a short term prognosis, you must be given a lot of questions about the end of life options. Mm. Yeah, so this is a question about if you're giving somebody a short-term prognosis, are we getting questions about the End of Life Option Act, which is a new uh, law in California permitting physician-assisted, um, physician aid in dying. And this has come up for me, and how do I respond? So I respond by trying to better understand their reasons for making that request. And in my clinical practice, what I've found is that when I explore people's reasons, that unburdens them. They can talk about these things and the sources of suffering, whether they're existential, social, spiritual, you know, physical. And then working with my interdisciplinary team, we address those sources of distress and those requests to die go away. Okay, and that's been in my clinical experience. I can't say that they'll always go away, or that they go away for everybody. Um, but I fortunately haven't had to face that situation. I, I work at the VA, 
and at the VA, we're a federal property. We are not allowed to, we are not in California. We are a federal institution. So we, uh, physician assisted, um, physician aid in dying is not permitted in uh, federal facilities. Um, so veterans would have to seek uh, care elsewhere if that was something they were interested in. Uh, some, anybody else who hasn't spoke? Okay, I'm gonna go back over here. Yes, go ahead. I have a question on how your cultural differences fit into your list. Oh, excellent question. Yes, so I do a lot of research in diverse communities. I love the rich diversity of San Francisco. Um, and I was surprised in that big study we did, 65 older adults, that there were no different, there, there were some differences by race and ethnicity, but there, it was not what I expected at all. You know, I thought that the Chinese patients, actually the majority of our patients in that study were Cantonese speaking, would say, um, don't tell me my prognosis. You know, if you're going to tell anybody, tell my son. <laughs> uh, that was not the case. And I think that may represent acculturation. Um, and uh, spread of this sort of value of autonomy. Um, uh, 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 I'd like to say that our materials are developed uh, to, to help physicians who practice in diverse communities um, work with those diverse communities, but that wouldn't be true. We're just not there yet in terms of communication. We're still working on the English language uh, communication piece before we bridge out to other languages. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.